Well, good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to this 24th day of November, day 328 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name's Hunter. I am your brother and Bible reading coach. Someone who shows up every day to spend a little time together in the pages of the Bible. And we're going to let the Bible do what the Bible does and direct our hearts now to the one who is the living Word of God, the one alone who has the words of life. And so we come. We come because we were made for life, my friend. And we come to warm our hearts by the fires of God's love, for that is who He is. And today, we are in the Gospel of Matthew again, chapters 17 through 19. And I am glad that you are here. Father, thank you. Help us to see. Matthew 17. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and they fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone and they saw only Jesus. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Then his disciples asked him, Why did the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus replied, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. But he wasn't recognized, and they chose to abuse him. And in the same way, they will also make the Son of Man suffer. Then the disciples realized he was talking about John the Baptist. At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into fire or into water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus said, You faithless and corrupt people. How long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon in the boy, and it left him. From that moment, the boy was well. Afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, Why couldn't we cast out the demon? You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, Move from here to there, (laughs) and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. After they gathered again in Galilee, Jesus told them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. And the disciples were filled with grief. On their arrival at Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, Peter replied. Then he went into the house. But before he had a chance to speak, Jesus asked him, What do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they've conquered? They tax the people they've conquered, Peter replied. Well then, Jesus said, The citizens are free. However... I don't want to offend them, so go down to the lake and throw in a line. Open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you'll find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. Matthew 18 About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, 
Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this one on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin? Temptations are inevitable. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes be thrown into the fires of hell. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others on the hills and go out and search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the ninety-nine that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied. But seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decides to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned, to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when that man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I'll pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I have had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Matthew 19 When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went down to the region of Judea, east of the Jordan River. Large crowds followed him there, and he healed their sick. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied. They record that from the beginning God made them male and female. And he said, 
This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away? They asked. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts. But it was not what God had originally intended. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. Jesus' disciples then said to him, If this is the case, it is better not to marry. Not everyone can accept this statement, Jesus said, only those whom God helps. Some are born as eunuchs, some have been made eunuchs by others, and some choose not to marry for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. But Jesus said, Let the children come to me, don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. Someone came to Jesus with this question, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones? the man asked. And Jesus replied, You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? Jesus told him, If you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved? they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Then Peter said to him, We've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? Jesus replied, I assure you, that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. And now may our Lord, who is the greatest, may he now give his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. A rich man came and bowed down before Jesus and asked him what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. This man had a lot of money, and on every one of his many coins was an image. In this case, it was Caesar. He was imprinted on every one of this rich man's coins. And this rich man wanted eternal life, and so he asked Jesus what he has to do in order to get it. And Jesus eventually gets to it. He says, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. Go and divest yourself of all those coins with Caesar's image and come and follow me. And the man, we're told, went away sad because he had so much. That money with Caesar's picture on it was a serious problem for this rich man. It was an idol. It was something the rich man believed in. It was a god to him. Money was the ultimate solution for him. It got him what he wanted when he wanted it. It solved his problems. It established his life. And yet this man knew it wasn't life. (laughs) 
That money was a lie that he was telling himself about God. A pretty good lie, mind you. To him, money was like God. It protected him. It provided for him. It gave him status and influence and power. And this money God had a face. It was the face of Caesar. But this currency God of Caesar and empire and power has its limits. Even in this world, and most certainly in the world to come, it's a fiction. It's founded on a lie. A functional lie, perhaps, but a lie nevertheless. The maker of heaven and earth, of every human being, is not money, nor is it Caesar. God's favor and blessing and love are not reserved only for those who possess all the little Caesar coins. That's not God. That's not what God's like. He is so much more than that, so much more generous than that, so much more beautiful than that. Jesus said it's impossible for those who worship the money God to enter into the kingdom of God. It won't pay their way in. The kingdom of God is nothing like the kingdom of Caesar. That currency has no value here. What God is asking this man to give up was a lie he was telling himself about God. Lies about who he is and what he's like. God is not like money. He's not transactional in nature. He's not impersonal. He's not exclusive to the fortunate few who have it. No, this is a lie. And sadly, religion often tells this very same lie about God, that he is transactional, that he is loving and forgiving of only those who do and say and pray the right things, that God is impersonal, that he's a strange conglomerate of theological concepts like omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence. And this impersonal God is merciful only to a select chosen few. See, these are lies too. God is not like the money God and he is nothing like the religious God either. It will be impossible for us to see the truth about who God really is if we keep on holding on to these lies. So Jesus tells him, get rid of them all and follow me. Because if he or we follow him, we will begin to see the truth. The lies will begin to be dispelled and the truth of who he is will set us free. Jesus is the truth about who God is. He is the exact likeness of the invisible God. There's nothing else you need to know about who God is and what he's like that is not revealed in the person of Jesus. So you keep looking to Jesus, because when you do, you will not only see him, you will also see yourself. And all the many lies that you tell about yourself, he will begin to set straight. You will see that you are made in the image of God, that God's presence is in you, that you are of absolute worth, and that you are loved by God, and you will begin to see others, all others, the way you see yourself. And the prayer of my own heart is that I will leave all the lies and look to the one who is the truth and be set free and follow him. That's the prayer that I have for my own soul. That's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, my son. And that's the prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Let's continue now in a time of prayer. Feel free to read along with these prayers in the show notes of today's podcast and meditate on these words that are being spoken over you, your family, and our world. And now, let us pray. Lord God, Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, 
that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit on all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power of and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we have once again spent a perfectly good 20 minutes opening our hearts, reflecting on those things that are good and true and life-giving, having our minds renewed through the washing of the Word, by offering prayers for our own soul, for those that we love, and for the life of this world. And we've done that because we have been drawn here. We have been compelled by the Spirit of God to grow. And you've responded <laughs> to grow. And that is a good thing indeed. But what do you say we keep responding, friend? Let's keep showing up. Let's keep opening our hearts. Let's keep training our hearts in ways of righteousness and life. And that right there is the whole purpose of this little podcast. That we would find our life in Christ. That we would grow in ways of love. And I'm so glad that I can do it together with you all. Speaking of you all, this podcast doesn't exist without you all. It is entirely supported by you, and I'm grateful for that. I'm blown away by it. And if you would like to join in with those that are doing that very thing, and that is so appreciated and so needed, and all you need to do is head on over to the webpage, dailyradiobible.com, click on that donate link, and you can start on that. Or if you're old school and you prefer to do things through the U.S. Post, you can reach us at Daily Radio Bible 2748 Northeast Molini Way, Hillsboro, Oregon 97124. Well, what do you say we show up again here tomorrow and we can do this again? Lord willing and the creek don't rise, your brother Hunter plans on being here. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this. That you are loved. No doubt about it. All right? I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.